Hello, I'm John Gardner, founder of Duty to Warn. We're a grassroots organization of mental health professionals who find Donald Trump to be deeply and dangerously psychologically disordered. And thus, we feel an ethical obligation to warn the public and to advocate that he be removed under the 25th Amendment. You know, this movement began right here at this desk when I posted a petition online for mental health professionals that said just what I'm telling you. In a few months, we had 58,000 signatures, and now we're having duty to warn meetings all across the United States on October 14th, after which we're going to submit the petition to the president's cabinet, which has the power to remove him under the 25th Amendment. You know, I think it's not accidental that I've actually yet to meet a single mental health professional who affirmatively believe that Donald Trump is psychologically competent to be president. And yet, so few of us have spoken out, in part because of the American Psychiatric Association's Goldwater Rule, which states that it is unethical to make statements about a public figure that you haven't personally examined. But more fundamental in our ethical code is a duty to educate and protect the welfare of the public, and specifically, a duty to warn people who are in danger. In the 1930s, a malignant narcissist rose to power in part because people were silent, including the mental health community. And we don't want to make that mistake again. In this movie, you're going to hear from mental health professionals who have spoken out. I wanted you to meet them and hear their testimony about why this one man's psyche threatens the safety and the survival of the entire planet. Thank you. There are a number of things wrong with the Goldwater Rule. For one thing, the Goldwater Rule was put into place before DSM-3. DSM-3 changed the way we do psychiatric diagnosis from a really psychodynamic formulation to much more observable behaviors. With the advent of DSM-3, the basis of psychiatric diagnosis becomes much more observable from a distance so that public behaviors become fair game. If I really feel compelled to speak out, I need to be able to do that and and not sit and, and fumble and wonder, well, maybe I shouldn't say anything because of my profession. That's when I should be able to speak out because of my profession, because I have sensitivities. And the problem with the Goldwater rule is that if it silences me because I'm afraid of what the professional repercussions might be, it does function as a gag order. Since I was committed to speaking out and to continuing to write uh, and uh, publish on the issue of Donald Trump's dangerousness, I felt this was an unacceptable infringement on my right as a citizen and as a professional to add to the dialogue in the public square to come to some uh, greater understanding of the extraordinary situation we found ourselves in. So I contacted the president of the American Psychiatric Association and told her that unless they rescinded this rule, that I would resign, resign my membership and my distinguished life fellowship, et cetera, after 41 years of uh, participation. The American Psychiatric Association said that uh, psychiatrists should not uh, offer an opinion as to somebody's uh, diagnosis or mental illness if they hadn't personally examined the person and also received his permission to make their conclusions public. Now, uh, there is, however, another legal rule called the Tarasov decision. This is a decision that was handed down by a court in California, but it really has standing throughout the country, that uh, gives psychiatrists a positive duty to speak out if they have reason to believe that a person is dangerous uh, to other, other people and uh, to warn the person or people uh, that he appears to them to be dangerous to, whether or not he gives them permission to, uh, to express those opinions. Uh, in other words, in that situation, a psychiatrist does not have the, the right 
the moral or legal right to remain silent. And I'm saying that's the situation we're in with Donald Trump. Uh, I'd say the Tarasov decision trumps the Goldwater rule. But I think that uh, it's important to recognize he is an exception. He is not a normal politician. We are in a pre-fascist state right now, and I would just urge my fellow rank-and-file members to let uh, personal conscience and obeying one's personal conscience uh, uh, overrule any, any deference to, to wrong-headed policies that are, are put forth by our professional organization. As your organization is called Duty to Warn, I, I think uh, that our, our duty uh, to protect our public, just as it would be with an individual patient, where safety always supersedes other concerns, I, I think uh, I, I, I feel an ethical obligation to speak out that is, is far greater than adherence to, to the Goldwater Rule. I'm, I'm utterly convinced as a, uh, as a psychiatrist that, uh, that Donald Trump is psychologically unfit to be president. It is clear that he is reckless, impulsive, self-absorbed. Um, we could go on and on, and that these characteristics pose a real danger uh, to society and to the world, really. I have devoted my life to studying uh, the... Uh causes and prevention of violence, including predictions of dangerousness. The fact that he is uh, uh, actually specifically has encouraged uh, his followers to beat up people uh, who are protesting at, uh, at his political rallies, um, and that they then have done that. Uh, you know, he's urged them to punch people in the face and beat them up so badly they'll have to be taken out on stretchers. Uh, and. Uh, and then complains that they weren't being violent enough. Um, I mean, if that's not incitement to violence, then nothing is an incitement to violence. And if that, if incitements to violence are not what is meant by the term dangerousness, then I don't know what is. That's not a question of, uh, of you know, having to interview somebody in private. He said this publicly. <laughs> All I'm doing is hearing what he said. And what I'm saying is that it would be, I think, irresponsible to act as if I were deaf. I'm not deaf. I mean, I, I, can, I can hear these words being spoken. He presents an unpredictable danger because what, what, what he might do, it's, it's almost impossible to predict because I'm saying he's like a little kid, you know, uh, in a sandbox with a hammer. The problem is, when you're in a position like Trump, what you do is dangerous, not only to you, it's dangerous to America, and now dangerous to the world. He's not the sort of person who will learn from his colleagues. He will not have a, a group of people who are truly advisors because he doesn't listen. He wants them to listen to him. Trump can't do it because the position of being a listener is too close to feeling controlled, uh, one down, and as if he doesn't know something. And the experience, I don't know something that I'm learning about from someone else, puts him in the position of feeling that there's something missing in him, and he can't stand it. There was a piece in The New Yorker in May uh, that had a quotation from Steve Schmidt, who was president, who was Senator uh, Ains' uh, uh, campaign manager in 2008, and he said, "There's nobody in the White House who can talk to Trump. Nobody." Um, that is a real concern. Most of us would say exactly the same thing if Donald Trump were a Democrat, which he used to be, by the way. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. This has nothing to do with politics. I'm not analyzing Trump's policies from a psychological point of view. I'm stating, you know, what I see is a man who appears unstable, at least in public, who isn't thinking clearly, who isn't speaking honestly. And I don't care what his position is, and I don't care whether I disagree with it or agree with it. It's not safe to have someone who's that unstable in office. Literally, it's not about politics, it's about apocalypse and the potential for apocalypse.
Someone with a narcissistic personality disorder is extremely fragile. They are holding together their sense of self through inflating their self-worth, through bragging, through um, getting people around them to admire them at all times. And it takes up a tremendous amount of energy because the, the person is afraid that if they don't get that adulation all the time, they're going to collapse and disappear and turn into nothing. Think of Donald Trump's boast about being the best at everything. As a clinician, when you hear that, you have to assume the opposite is what is being feared, that he's nothing, that he's not good at anything, that he has no power, that he has no worth. So to maintain distance from that fear, he has to build up the other side. You see, he uses the word loser a lot. And so if we're in a clinical situation and someone is fixated on other people being losers, we just don't even think twice about assuming that they are afraid of feeling like losers themselves. So when they win something like a presidential election and then the results are called into question, it is the quintessential um, threat and injury to somebody who is himself afraid of being a loser. When he's sitting alone in the White House at four in the morning and he's watching the news that is threatening to expose him or shame him and he rages against the, um, the mainstream media and starts to tweet, his tweets can create problems for him and others. Personality disorders in general are a collection of adaptive behaviors that are created subconsciously to protect an underlying woundedness, right? So the person, young in life, because personality disorders are, are rooted in childhood, they felt a wound to the actual self, like I am worthless or I am powerless or I am in danger. That feeling, that woundedness was so overwhelming and so intolerable that the subconscious, much like in denial or dissociation, it, the subconscious creates something. And in personality disorders, it creates a facade, um, a way of interacting with the world in, that will protect that underlying woundedness. In narcissistic personality disorder specifically, the wound is worthlessness. Okay, And then the facade that's created to protect it is I am the best. I am the most capable, I am the best, I am the richest, I am the most whatever. So when the, the facade is threatened in any way, right? So if what comes at the facade is criticism or challenging or disappointing or failure, right? Any kind of energy like that, the facade is like the soldier. It's like it gets, it gets alarmed. Right. And what happens is, oh, no, this worthlessness is going to be felt. I can't even take in that I didn't do something perfectly. I can't take it in. I must fight back. Every moment is just a reaction of that moment. And how can I feed my facade in that moment? It's as though he um, he lives in his body like everything is a snapshot. Right. There's no movie where the, the frames go together right? Everything is a snapshot. If one follows the DSM-5, which, which I do as a psychiatrist, uh, of course, a personality disorder is something that is pervasive across one's lifespan and in a multitude of settings. And the general overarching description for a sociopath is that they have a, uh, a, a disregard for and a consistent violation of the rights of others. And then one goes down the, the trait list, there are seven of them, and I see that, that uh, Trump meets six of the seven easily. Um, I already mentioned impulsivity beyond that. Uh, at the top of the list is the failure to conform to societal norms, uh, which leads to the engagement in unlawful behavior. Uh, we've seen this with the Trump University scam uh, during the campaign, his encouragement of Russian hacking. And, and now his use of the White House to further his business interests. Uh, secondly, we talked about his deceitfulness. 
And again, we saw this uh, when he was a businessman, when uh, it would be laughable if he were a mere billionaire businessman, but that he was calling media outlets, uh, identifying himself as John Miller and John Barron. You and I uh, have, have a moral compass. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced that Donald Trump, as, as a sociopath, uh, has, has a compass, that he moves by, by any other guide by his own perceived self-interest. You said Donald Trump tells two kinds of lies, the kinds he tells to others and the kinds he tells to himself. His lying uh, has really two parts to it. Part of it is because since he is a, uh, he's a con man, he's, uh, he's, uh, he uh, manipulates people, he lies, he cheats, he will do anything in order to get his, his way. So like any con man, he will lie for that purpose. He will lie to try to sell you something that uh, he wants you to buy, whether it's good for you or whether it really is a good product or not. And he'll lie about himself all the time. So there's that kind of lying. Uh, but there's also another and deeper kind of lying, which is that because he needs so much to see the world in the way that he sees it, he's out of touch with reality in to that degree because he sees the world the way he needs to uh, because of his tremendous emotional instability. And uh, so part of the lying is actually a kind of uh, delusional thinking. He doesn't, he, he makes up reality, he makes up alternate facts, uh, and, and he denies actual facts. So that, that has the effect of being a lie because he's telling people things that are simply not true, but it's also because he, and because he's manipulating them, but it's also because he really loses track, especially, especially when he's enraged. And he gets enraged when he feels attacked, and he feels attacked a lot of the time. So on a good day, he's just a normal liar, <laughs> and on a bad day, he's delusional. Uh, I would say that that's probably right, although I don't know how many good days he has. There's considerable and mounting evidence to suggest we're not just talking about a con man, we're not just talking about uh, a self-absorbed son of a bitch. We're talking about a guy who has psychotic core beliefs of grandeur on the one side and the other side there are enemies everywhere. I learned uh, as a medical student that a delusion is a fixed false belief that someone possesses an, in an absence of objective evidence and that they cannot be persuaded to the contrary. And we have seen with Donald Trump multiple times that he is paranoid and delusional. Uh, one example of this would be his uh, Twitter allegation that uh, President Obama was wiretapping him at the Trump Towers. I have to say, during the, the primary season, when he would say things like, I know more than the generals, or my book is the most important book, uh, along with the Bible, um, I'm the most religious man, I'm all those things. I thought he's a showman. It's like, T I thought it was P.T. Barnum. You know, I thought he was just saying, you know, it's, it's like Muhammad Ali saying I'm the greatest. It was sort of like that. I've come to realize that's not true. He believes all those things. These are delusions. These are not um, sort of crowd-pleasing, braggy lines, man. This, this guy is serious about it. When he says he knows more about the Bible than anyone, at that moment he thinks that's true. My concern is that the, the public and the legislators need to be educated about what personality disorders are and what transient psychotic states are. And, and you know, when we say that, that, that he's mentally ill, if we say he's psychotic, I'm not arguing that he's hearing voices or believes that he's, you know, the son of God or I mean, these are gross psychotic states that you see in people with severe psychotic disorders. The problem about personality disorders is that there are more subtle forms, not that subtle, but subtle forms of psychotic thinking that the public isn't really familiar with. So I'm observing impairment or basically a significant change in his sharpness from videos that are available from years ago. You listen to him at times and it just doesn't stick together. 
Um, the associations are all over the place. I speak about this from uh, a lot of clinical experience. It's no exaggeration to say that I've uh, supervised and, and directly worked with, uh, with thousands of individuals with various types of dementias, whether Alzheimer's or post-stroke, uh, you name it. Um, and I, I, again, I see many echoes of the symptoms I've seen in those, uh, those sufferers. We also tend to see with dementia uh, a tendency towards perseveration, saying the same thing over and over again. Um, we see a diminishing vocabulary uh, and a diminished substance to individual statements. And I, I think we've, we see all of this in, in Trump's uh, uh, extemporaneous speaking. You predicted in this letter uh, that was written in February that he would get worse. And your predictions, I think, have borne out. Could you say more about why you predicted that he would get worse? There are two things. As his criminal grandiosity uh, is, is um, bolstered, people look, he, now he's the president. So he feels, and he, in fact, he, he said, now I can do anything I want, basically. So he does. So um, he's, it, it, it's like having a, uh, a very small child who has no limit. And the other thing is that with this position of power, he runs into more and more objections. There have been massive demonstrations against him in this country. And of course, he's been soundly criticized by other countries, including and especially our allies. Um, so he can't stand that. So he becomes all the more paranoid, and then his actions become all the more destructive because he's out to attack. Uh, so, yes, and he will continue to get worse the more uh, he is, until he is uh, removed by the congressional, uh, uh, the constitutional means, he will continue to get more, the more attack he is, the more paranoid he is going to become, the more... Uh, horrible will be his actions. I think we have not seen the most extreme form of Trumpism. That is, that's the danger. Even though what he's done is, is you know, inconceivable uh, in a president, I, I think, I think as he becomes more threatened, you know, maybe with this Russian, Russian uh, influence scandal, you know, as, as he feels more threatened as his power is more threatened, he's likely to do really da more dangerous, more extreme things to get attention, uh, uh, to get people to show that he he is the power man. He's he's in charge. He's he's the dominant Trump uh, power broker, uh, and and the world the world is his apprentice. I had a patient who was an Arab student who saw swastikas um, uh, on the door of a Muslim Students Association that she had to walk past. So it was like a double um, assault on her um, and other patients who, uh, who had seen uh, swastikas on their dorm room whiteboards. And my son's uh, playground was um, defaced with the swastika on a train um, jungle gym. And uh, at the time he's five, and so we had to face trying to explain to a five-year-old what a swastika is. And that is just not something any parent really wants to have to do. Um, and I, that, that particularly hit home for me. And, and I'm, you know, it was removed immediately, but, but it really made me feel vulnerable. I have seen um, folks who don't feel safe um, traveling, uh, who, who don't feel safe right after, this was right after the election, it's faded a little bit more, uh, don't feel safe walking down the street because of the identities they hold. Um, he's really uh, created an atmosphere of fear um, in those who feel that he does not, whom, whom he does not represent, um, or who he's actively said that, such as the immigrant populations in New York, so many people hold that identity. So I have a colleague um, 
<clears throat> who's Latina and teaches in the English department at Syracuse University. And she said that after the election, she started getting hate mail and comments to her on the street that she had never experienced in her lifetime. The really nasty effect of, of, of Trumpism is promoting in America uh, the worst the worst values of of uh, of prejudice, discrimination, dominance. I, I'm sure there's even a, a general increase in bullying. Uh, you know, just giving people a set, kids who would ordinarily might do some bullying. It's now encouraging them. It's reviving anti anti semitism. It's reviving uh, anti uh, African American uh, hostilities. Uh, so it's it's giving it's giving voice to a minority of Americans who maybe were always prejudiced, who were always, you know, uh, hated Jews, hated blacks, uh, hated Muslims. At the level of everyday life, there is this uh, normalizing of degrading uh, talk um, uh, of demonization of others. The alt-right, the ultra-nationalists, the KKK, I mean, the, the, these folks um, see this as their moment. Historical comparisons are always tricky, but, you know, I think of, of when Yugoslavia broke up, you know, and people had lived, the uh, Serbians and the Croats, and, you know, they had lived together for centuries in relative peace. Uh, and then you have the social upheaval and you have a demagogic leader, Milosevic, coming along and you just stir these things up. Uh, and so uh, that's what I see going on in our country. I treat um, at a major hospital in Manhattan um, survivors of sexual uh, assault, domestic violence, and uh, adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. And um, right after the election, uh, folks were really hit hard. When you look at somebody who some people see as a perpetrator elected to the highest office in the country, um, who seems um, unrepentant and um, in fact quite uh, uh, proud of what uh, he's done in terms of getting away with all sorts of uh, violent um, assertions and, and acts, if you want to call, quote, pussy grabbing a violent act, which I would. They had a loss of hope. Um, one of them said, we elected a rapist to the presidency. Um, so it was a real um, invalidating experience for them. So he is a danger to our very democracy. He would destroy it if he could. I think we're probably stronger than the Germany was when Hitler did the same thing in 1932. But he has no interest in anything but having power himself. There is a, a mindset among all sadistic tyrants. And uh, it, it's, it's Hitler, but it's also Stalin. It's also uh, Pol Pot in the, the Southeast Asia. We have, uh, unfortunately, humankind has always developed these terrible, sadistic, narcissistic, um, malicious people who need to have power. And because they're good at it, they get power. And I would say it's, it's incredibly ironic, but not an accident, that his campaign slogan was, make America great again, when in fact he is the greatest danger to America uh, in my lifetime. In my 49 years on this planet, I, I feel like uh, uh, currently our democratic republic is, is, under, is in the greatest peril that I've seen. Uh, with Donald Trump in the White House, we have an inept, corrupt autocrat with fascist tendencies. Uh, in Congress, we have a Republican majority that uh, only sporadically seems to have a backbone to stand up to him, and a uh, Democratic minority that, that verges on powerlessness. Uh, this is Fascism 101. In some ways, what's most troubling of all to me about uh, about Trump uh, is his disdain for our institutions, for the courts, for the Congress, for the press, um, uh, the, 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 the checks and balances in, in our system. I see Trumpism as a, a cult of the strong man uh, who is going to take care of all of our problems. Um, the cult of uh, the demonization of uh, people who, who differ uh, and this reliance on 
uh, this um, outside figure, this 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 figure who disdains the institutions um, uh, and uh, and norms of uh, civil conversation uh, for to cre- kind of create his own revolution. He's part of the, this right wing totalitarian movement that's happening in many countries around the world, and it just simply means replacing democracy by the people with autocracy by a single leader or a limited a limited um, uh, leadership group. I had large parts of my family uh, killed during the war. Uh, I'm mostly in Auschwitz. My mother's side of the family was Hungarian. And um, the guy I was named after, my great Great grandfather, great, uh, uh, my grandfather's grandfather. Uh, 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 he fried in Auschwitz. Hundreds of people in the family. I grew up in a home in which, on holidays, uh, my grandmother would light. I don't know how many lights. It would be a table full of lights, each one with a name on it. And it's been beaten into our heads. Don't never forget, never forget, never forget. So how did everyone forget? Why do we keep forgetting? The other danger is because of his paranoia that other uh, countries and their leaders will disagree with him. And that happens all the time in world politics. But if it's Donald Trump, then he takes it personally. It's an assault on him, which he cannot stand. So they become enemies, and he attacks. If uh, someone in a position like Trump's uh, were to feel upstaged or humiliated by another leader, let's say someone either domestically or someone internationally, one might infer that this would be intolerable, and that someone's response, we call this narcissistic rage. If it were extreme enough, it could uh, provoke somebody to respond militarily to a perceived slight that um, a leader experiences as quite personal, even though it really is public and political. Of course, we're all afraid of him you know, starting a war or doing something impulsive on the, on the, uh, on the stage, of the global stage. So I could see him instigating a military action against North Korea, saying, you know, um, th- that that uh, America doesn't have to be, um, uh, you know, a puppet, you know, to this crazy guy in North Korea. We got to show him. We got to show him who's number one, who's boss. This man has the codes. This man has the nuclear codes. In under five minutes, they're in the air. It means we exist one second. And the next second, we don't, along with everything and everyone else. That's what happens, you know, at two in the morning, he launches. We, we don't wake up. 